You're listening to Policy Currents, a weekly podcast from the RAND Corporation. I'm Evan Banks. And I'm Deanna Lee. Every Friday, we bring you new insights from RAND's latest research and commentary. It's December 15th. As 2023 draws to a close, you might be taking time to reflect on the past year. In a wide-ranging essay published this week on RAND.org, our president and CEO, Jason Matheny, is doing the same. Like many of us, Matheny feels the weight of the world's problems. But he's also heartened by the optimistic urgency of RAND's work. Where there are thoughtful people working tirelessly to find solutions, he writes, there is hope. Matheny highlights some of the many ways Rand is tackling the world's most urgent and complex issues. You should definitely check out his essay on Rand.org. But on today's episode, we'll give you just a few examples, highlighting new Rand research and expert insights on some of the biggest policy stories of 2023. First, the Israel-Hamas war. The toll this conflict has taken on civilians has been devastating. And as the humanitarian crisis worsens, where can the people of Gaza go? Israel has pushed for Egypt to take in the 1.8 million people, more than 80% of Gaza's population, who have already been displaced since the Israeli military operation began roughly two months ago. According to Rand Shelley Culbertson, turning Gazans into refugees, and especially moving them into camps, is a bad idea. While pushing Gazans to Egypt or elsewhere might seem like a viable short-term solution, it could lead to long-lasting generational devastation. To start, few refugees would likely ever end up returning to Gaza. Israel has a history of not accepting refugees back, and past RAND research has shown that even 10 years after a conflict ends, only about 30% of refugees have returned home. Return rates are even lower when the conflict is ongoing or unsettled. Palestinians' history as refugees over the past 75 years adds to this tale of caution. About 750,000 Palestinians were displaced during the creation of Israel in 1948, with an additional wave of 300,000 following in 1967. Today, there are 5.9 million descendants of those displaced, one-third of whom still live in camps in Gaza, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria. What began as refugee camps in those two wars evolved into today's overcrowded urban slums. Greater Palestinian displacement could also further destabilize the Middle East, Culbertson says, by making escalation into a regional war more likely, and eroding prospects for long-term peace between Israel and its neighbors. One thing is clear. The people of Gaza need help. But none of the options for protecting them come without grim trade-offs. The least bad of all the bad options? Keep civilians in southern Gaza, and provide protection and humanitarian assistance where they are. America's opioid crisis remains one of the greatest challenges we face. Illicit fentanyl and other opioids have continued to disrupt communities and claim lives all over the country. Rand Research has helped illuminate many complexities of the opioid crisis, including a link between opioids and a different crisis, the mental health of America's youth and, sadly, child suicides. Up until 2011, child suicide rates in the U.S. had been declining for decades. Then, from 2011 to 2018, suicide rates among children ages 10 to 17 began rising at an unprecedented level. In 2020, in fact, suicide was the second leading cause of death among children ages 10 to 17. A new RAND study finds that this increase was fueled, in part, by the nation's opioid crisis. What explains this? In 2010, OxyContin was reformulated to make it harder to crush the pills, to inject, or snort. This change caused people who misused opioids to seek other sources of drugs, leading to a large increase in the use of illicit opioids such as heroin. In turn, this contributed to worsening conditions for many children, 
including increased rates of neglect and altered living arrangements. Geographic areas that were more exposed to the effects of the OxyContin reformulation, because they had higher pre-existing rates of prescription OxyContin misuse, experienced sharper growth in child suicide rates than other regions of the nation. So, while there isn't evidence to suggest that the use of illicit opioids increased among children, our study shows that kids may have been negatively impacted by the broader effects of America's opioid crisis. It's yet another grim reason why further action is needed to address this problem. Otherwise, its effects on families, children, and communities may only worsen. Another top policy issue this past year, and likely for years to come, is U.S. competition and rising tensions with China. Rand's Derek Grossman recently wrote in Foreign Policy about one key aspect of this issue, America's strong partnerships with other nations in the Indo-Pacific. These include a relationship with Taiwan that is the strongest it's been since 1979, a solid U.S.-Philippines alliance, and bolstered ties in Oceania. Grossman says U.S. alliances and partnerships in the Indo-Pacific are, quote, just about the deepest and most robust they have been in all their history. Grossman credits both the exceptional durability of U.S. alliances and partnerships, as well as the Biden administration's ongoing efforts to strengthen Indo-Pacific relationships and counter continued aggression by China and North Korea. In fact, Grossman says, U.S. relations in the region are receiving a major assist from Beijing itself, whose relentless assertiveness is heightening anxiety among its neighbors. Quote, This has convinced more and more countries in the region to ditch their hedging, the old but increasingly unworkable mantra of not wanting to choose sides and engage in a balancing strategy against China. It's unclear whether this geostrategic balancing is good or bad for prospects of maintaining global peace and stability. But regardless, it is clearly good news for the U.S. Even though there is a lot for U.S. leaders to be pleased about in the Indo-Pacific, there is still room for improvement. The biggest obstacle for the United States, according to Grossman, is that Washington lacks a true economic strategy for the region. This inherently limits the depth of its strategic cooperation. That said, the U.S. is expected to continue to bolster and expand its regional network to complicate and deter future actions that China, as well as North Korea, might take to threaten, undermine, or otherwise undo the Indo-Pacific order. This year, headlines were often dominated by news of intensifying disasters, including devastating wildfires on Maui and earthquakes in Turkey and Syria that killed tens of thousands of people. Such disasters will only become more frequent and severe as the effects of climate change become more pervasive. Further, low-income communities and communities of color are disproportionately vulnerable to the risks of these disasters— and encounter the most difficulty in recovering from them. A RAND report published just this week looks at what can be done to help both public entities and individual households absorb the financial impact of a disaster. These include the costs associated with evacuating, possible periods of unemployment for individuals, and physical damage to both private and public property caused by the event. The authors highlight programs and products that some communities have already adopted to help address this. For instance, several state governments have created catastrophe savings accounts, which are tax-advantaged savings accounts that can be used to provide quick cash and cover out-of-pocket expenses after a disaster. Additionally, community-based insurance models have been proposed to help fill gaps in private insurance coverage and federal assistance benefits. And charities and non-governmental organizations have developed innovative approaches for distributing assistance to those affected by a disaster, including using blockchain technology for direct cash payments to households. All these programs and policies, as well as other ideas outlined in the report, may be useful to state and local governments looking to help communities rebound from natural disasters more quickly. That's it for today's episode of Policy Currents. 
For our complete list of the year's top policy stories, visit RAND.org. And for more information on the research and insights we discussed today, check the show notes at RAND.org slash podcast. This is our last episode of 2023. As always, thanks for listening. We'll be back in your feeds on January 5th. Until then, have a safe and enjoyable holiday season and a happy new year.